Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 9 at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. You can also visit us online at gbcportage.com. Today we continue the Foundational Framework Sermon Series with Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. So everybody has a copy of the Bible, yes? Pick up where we left off at last week and give a, 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 a kind of step into what we're dealing with. We are dealing with something called the F train. Again, the F train is just an illustration. That's all it is. But hopefully it's a helpful one. Has anybody been noticing that your cars are a little bit more out of whack than what you thought they were? Anybody? Would anybody like the little trains? I've got some trains left. Some of you would like them. Excellent. Zach, do you care to help me? You wouldn't mind? Pass this down. <laughs> Got to do something around here. Go. That's a joke. Come on. Oh, here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't care how he feels. I'm just interested in the facts. <laughs> just kidding. Anybody else? We good? Oh, man. That's why he's doing it. He's quick. Anybody else? We good? Right here? Yes? It won't hurt you. It's not a real train. It's okay. Everybody has to make choices in life. And not only making choices, everybody has an authority in any given situation in life. There's always somebody in charge of something. Raise your hand if you're in charge of something or someone. Okay? Raise your hand if somebody is in charge of you. Same people, if not more. Raise your hand if no one's in charge of you. I wonder where Tom went, okay? <laughs> he obviously vacated. <laughs> I know what question he's going to ask. Everybody has an authority to answer to. There is some standard of truth or an expectation that is set in any situation of which we are answerable. That immediately implicates us as people of personal responsibility. One thing that we looked at was the fact that we've got to have an unchanging standard of truth. We've got to have facts of a situation. You've got to have something that is always true if you're going to have a foundation to stand on. Some of you fish, yes? I can say catch fish, right? Not kill fish. Okay, I said catch a deer. Some of you guys lost it. But in catching fish, the more that you do it, the more you start to learn some things, right? Where they're biting, what kind of bait's going to work, whether or not you put enough uh, line in your reel. Anybody ever cast it out and you just kept going and just me? <laughs> I'll never forget that. My grandfather passed away and one of the things that I inherited was his, his tackle box and his rod and reel. And so uh, I went out to fish one day and all, all I knew was what he had taught me the two or three times we had gone. My friend and I are sitting out there and I go to cast out and I, you know, fix this bait on here and I'm like, surely it's got to do something. It's huge. And all right, here we go, and cast it out like that, and it just kept going <laughs> all the way out of the rod, and so I threw the rod in the water and quit. <laughs> that was it, no fishing for me. But as you fish more, you learn things, and you know that there are always certain truths you're going to find. Let's just be really basic. If you're going to fish, you got to have water, right? That's a truth. And it's so true, sometimes we overlook the fact that it's true. In order to fish, you've got to have some way to catch the fish, right? So that's a little bit more like, okay, we're, we're talking more mechanics here, but you've also got to have what? you got to have fish, or you don't catch any fish. Why do they restock ponds all the time? Because people have been catching fish. Sometimes it's the simple truths that elude us. And that's what I'm finding by and large whenever we live our lives. God has a truth and he has spoken authoritatively in many different situations. So our engine, our facts, are the truth of God's word and what he has said and most manifestly made known to us in these last days, as Hebrews 1 tells us, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Only in facts are power. Only in facts. 
Nothing else has power. We like to think they have power, but they don't. And so what we looked at last week is, what if we get our cars out of alignment? What if we take the car of faith and put it up front? Faith is what you truly believe about something. It is you having a confident conviction that something is true. What is a confident conviction that you have? Somebody share it with me. No one is confidently convicted of anything? I find that hard to believe. Just, what's that? What? Madison's weird. You are confidently convinced of that. You look a little embarrassed, are you sure? Okay, he's convinced. I don't even know where to go with that. But he's convinced that that's true. What are the facts of the situation? How do you remedy the idea that Madison is weird? Because what does it cause you to do in that, in that exchange? By you thinking that, what does it cause you to do? Reject it? Stay away from them? Okay. What did you say, Roger? Judge them. That's easy, isn't it? So how do we rectify that confident conviction? Madison is full of people. It's a lot of times what we believe about a situation that will keep us from what's real about the situation. Madison is full of people. Jesus died for people. Everybody see the connection? Doesn't matter if they're weird. It'd be really interesting if I showed you guys some pictures of me from 15 and 20 years ago. Do you guys know I used to have dreadlocks? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Emily's not in here. I showed Emily the picture of me with dreadlocks. Yeah. All beeswaxed up, matted, didn't wash it for forever. Big, thick. Yeah. What? Did it itch? A little bit it did. Whenever you would run it under the water, just all this black stuff would come out. It was great. See, there's things about me that are scary. Thank you, Maxine. Everybody remember, this is Grace Bible church, okay? But what we often believe about things can keep us from operating according to the facts of a situation. And we don't like it when our convictions, our faith is messed with. The reason is, is because when our faith is jostled by the facts of scripture, we all of a sudden have to rethink and change what we're believing about a situation. Why is that? because the authority has spoken. Does that make sense? And so when we find people that say that they're religious, I'm a religious person. Well, you can be convinced, you can have faith in something all day long, but if it is not of substance and it is not truth, it still falls in the category of unbelief. We talked about how everybody's dealing with an identity problem. Identity problem. Some of us are characterized by our jobs. That's our identity. Some of us are characterized by our role in a familial setting. Some of you, when you became grandmothers, lost your ever-loving minds. Don't play like you didn't. Because my mom and my mother-in-law did. All of a sudden, something becomes different. And what would have never been allowed when I was a kid is all of a sudden spring break at their house. Look, I got them suckers, every color. What are you doing? Identity causes you to act irrationally. Social media. How many of you live on Facebook? Okay, at least you admit it. Right? I just can't wait to post about what's going on today and what I did. And here's a picture and here's a poem. And what's that person doing? I can't believe she cut her hair like that. Right? Right? Girl, that eyeshadow looks so bad. Don't do that. But we do that. And that's what identifies us. And to be honest, let's, let's think about it. A lot of us are a lot more comfortable with who we are online than who we are in person. Isn't this why dating sites always have, yeah, that's her picture, but that ain't her. Right? Because they're a lot more comfortable in the fantasy. They want people to believe something different than the facts of the situation. Everybody see that? So that's where you run into a problem when faith is the lead car. But today we're going to look at feelings. Feelings running the lead car. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. 
when feelings are the lead car. I feel that. Well, if it feels good, do it. I'm hooked on a feeling. Right? But <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Emily, did you hear all that singing? <laughs> a lot of people just want to join the choir. There it is. Feelings, right? More than a feeling. Let's hope so. Good grief. Because feelings have no basis, no substance. In fact, I'm going to let you in on the secret about feelings. Feelings are simply the mask that is expressing the faith. No one ever just does something off of feeling, do they? Don't you have to be convinced that it's true? In fact, in our legal system, Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the fact that you thought through something, a crime, before you commit it, they always label it as premeditated? That means that you rolled it over in your mind to be convinced that something was happened before the action. Some crimes are committed in a blind rage, but even in that split instance, we were convinced that that was the best course of action. And usually, not usually, almost all the time, you find that that course of action was completely self-serving. Always. Always. Now, understand, and I'll say it again. I said it two, three weeks ago. Feelings are not bad. Feelings are really good. It's good that we have them. God gave them to us. But when they are in the lead car, we all become nut jobs. And I'm not even kidding. How many people have dealt with somebody that is being steered by their feelings? Okay? How are you doing with those people? It's not good, is it? Irrational. Not thinking clearly at all. You sometimes are like, do you even live where I live? Because you find something else has become the accepted truth that is pushing their car forward or that they think is pushing it forward when it really has no power at all, you kind of wonder why they're frustrated. So one thing I wanted to do with deal some, is deal with some of the common emotions and show how when feelings try to get up front, and remember what feelings are really doing, are resting closely with faith. In other words, feelings show you the symptoms. Faith is really what the root of the problem is. We're believing something other than the facts of the situation. Look at Matthew 11. We looked at this a while back, but I want us to see it again. Look at verse 2. Now when John, this is John the Baptist, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ. Now stop. He heard what Jesus was doing while he was in prison. Right? Good things, right? Jesus doing good things? I mean, that's kind of like the Sunday school answer, right? Absolutely. And so it probably came across John's mind, wait a second, I was the forerunner for you, I was letting people know that I'm not worthy to tie your sandals. We're baptizing people with the baptism of repentance so that they would believe on you when you came. And I'm in prison. And you're supposed to be the Messiah. And you're not ruling. But you're here. What is going on? And so notice, because of the present circumstances, because of what he expects, what he feels ought to be happening... His F train is out of whack. So look what he does. He sent word by his disciples and said, Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Notice that he's doubting. Everybody see that? Doubt very much rests in what we believe about a situation, but it's a feeling, is it not? Anybody ever been overcome with doubt? Good grief, just read a Charlie Brown cartoon. You don't have very long to find that one. Doubt. It's everywhere. It plagues our society. And that's what this, well, that might be true for you, not true for me. A lot of that comes from the fact of the idea we can't really know. We can really know. Notice that even with all of the privileged information and calling and ministry and the results that he saw God do in front of his eyes, John is in a situation where he's doubting. In fact, we would probably say that he may be entering into depression at this point. So watch what happens. Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? 
I love that Jesus doesn't send back by way of his disciples a smackogram. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He doesn't chide him. He doesn't tear him down. He doesn't say, well, if you were a good Christian at all, you would have believed this to begin with. All right? No eating sour lemons here on Jesus' part. But look what he does. Here's what's interesting. Notice. He sympathizes with John's doubts, and he corrects his F train. Notice it says here, Jesus answered and said to him, go and report to John what you hear and see. Now, that's weird, because didn't John already hear what was going on with Jesus? But notice his problem was he wasn't believing what he heard. Everybody see that? He was letting something else creep up and take the lead car. Here's what he says. Verse 5, the blind receive sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Now, John is a smart man and he knows his Old Testament. So as Jesus is bringing forward, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. Have you noticed in your translation, there's a lot of caps in there that's going on in the NASB, all caps in those things? The reason is, is because they are quoting portions of the prophet Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 29, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 61. And all of those passages deal with the characteristics of who the Messiah would be in Jesus Christ. What is Jesus doing? He is addressing John's doubt by laying facts before him that are taking place in front of his eyes that completely correspond with the truth that has been given. He's setting the facts up forward so that John will have the power to continue forward. Does everybody see that? How is doubt and depression overcome? It's overcome by having sound truths of which to plant your feet. Some of you might not like that. Sometimes when a pastor speaks to depression, some people get real weird about it. Don't think for a minute that I don't understand what depression is. I've had a lot of experience with, with people that are close to me that are clinically depressed. And let's be honest, I think Pastor Steve would amen this. Depression is almost a requirement to be a pastor. It is. It's part of it. It comes with it. In fact, there would be weeks on end where Charles Spurgeon was laid up in bed because he couldn't even get out of bed. He was so depressed about things. That man's preaching to 7,000 people in an auditorium not using a microphone. How incredible is that? Does there seem to be, I mean, he had an extremely fruitful ministry. Why is he so depressed? Why do you think it is? Who do you think is after him? Think about that. Let's not pretend like he's not real. Greatest thing he wants to do is discourage the saints. He loves pulling out the scalpel of doubt and doing surgical precision work on every one of our minds and hearts. So in order to correct that, we need the truth to get involved and to saturate us so that we begin thinking differently than we are thinking according to reality. Either God's telling the truth or he's lying. It can't be both. It's not both and, it's either or. So doubt, depression. Notice how Jesus deals with it gently, graciously with John. He simply gives him truth to focus his mind on, to saturate his being. How about this? This is always a fun one. Anger. You know what? Let's not do that one yet. Let's do assurance. We talked about assurance, but I'm not assured that everybody bought it. Let's turn to Romans. Romans chapter 8. One of the greatest doubts that Christians have in their lives is the assurance of their salvation. In fact, if you notice out on the wall as you walk out the door, there are two tracks that are right up front. One is called, It's That Simple. And that unfolds very simply the message of salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. But there's another one that's white and blue. And it is called, It Is That Certain. And that is a tract that is for believers. Believers need a tract. Do you guys believe that? A lot of them do. 
especially when you get into these other belief systems where there's a, well, you need to be baptized to be saved. Well, you better have confessed this. Well, you need to go here. We need to talk to this guy. You need to do this. You need to join this church. Whatever it is, putting extra stipulations on salvation, that immediately creates doubt because everybody's wondering if they've ever done it correctly. Anybody here been baptized more than once? Why? Did the first one not do the job? I don't make fun of you. I've been baptized four times in really various places, hotel swimming pools, because I didn't think that the first one took. We better get it done again. I was always worried. Well, maybe a couple of hairs didn't get under. Everybody see how weird that is. See all the weirdness that I have in my life. It's not you guys. It's me. I don't know. Maybe my dreadlocks prevented the baptismal waters of getting me. Who knows? But it's the assurance of salvation that often escape people. And so they doubt. Feelings get in the lead car. And the train stops. And then we go to Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced. I am convinced. Convinced. Paul is confidently convicted of something. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Does everybody see when he says the word convinced, he's revealing to his readers where the faith car is, and then he starts loading you with a lot of facts. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you in Christ Jesus? What does it take to get in Christ Jesus? Have you believed in him? Do you believe that he is your savior, that he died in your place? If that is the case, he's now the lead car. And nothing can separate you from God's love. Paul's convinced. Paul is saying, my F train goes like this. Line up your train. Believe in these facts. What can overcome God? Tell me nothing. Are you sure? Because we often feel that he's distant or he's not listening or he's not there or my sin was so bad. Maybe I was able to undo the fingers of God's grip on me. Is that true? Good grief. I hope not. Let's give one that people really love. Second Timothy, second Timothy two. This is a great assurance verse as well. I'm going to have to pronounce some Greek, so Mary Cooper, just shake your head yes or no if I got it. 2 Timothy 2, verse 13. This is one verse. I have found that this one verse has caused more troubles in my conversation with people than any other verse I could ever bring up. Because it's so simple, it's so plain, it's so beautiful, it is so true, and people can't handle it. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. If you have any questions or comments, please contact us at P.O. Box 534, Portage, Wisconsin, 53901, or email us at gracebibleportage at gmail.com. If you've missed any episodes of Walking in Grace, you can listen on our website at gbcportage.com. Scroll down to the Walking in Grace link. Also, you can join us Sunday mornings at 9 at Grace Bible Church, located at 2939 County Highway CX, next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can join the live stream on YouTube or our website at gbcportage.com. Thanks again for listening to Walking in Grace.